Drag racing fan, Monday morning racer here once again. We're still under lockdown. That doesn't mean we can't catch up with anyone on Zoom. And we've caught up with Adam Lambert on Drag Racing TV, all brought to you by Strutmasters.com, the suspension experts. Now, he happens to be an expert in drag racing suspension. He is the owner of Precision Racing Shocks. Adam, look, we know you're somewhere there in Pennsylvania. Give us the rundown of where you're at, what it's near to, and what type of facility you're working there at PRS. Uh, we're based in Fleetwood, Pennsylvania. We're about 15 minutes driving distance from Penske Racing Shocks, so who's our main uh, vendor, I guess you'd call it. We buy probably 90% of our products through them and then put our own twist on it in-house and do all the tuning and you know car set up and deal with the customers on a one-to-one -one basis uh, directly from our shop. Uh, it's it's nice. We're you know we're only about 25 30 minutes from Maple Grove, uh, what used to be English Town within driving distance. But we we travel to all the different venues throughout the world. I mean, the Middle East, Australia, all across the United States, anywhere that there's drag racing, we're we're there. Definitely notice that on the website. Let me dive in to that uh, Pinsky relationship. So you said you buy some components and then you put your own twist on it. So what do you mean by twist? What is it in a shock that you're actually working with and building that makes it the PRS brand? Uh, I, mean, I mean, really, it's no different than going to buy a, a Mustang from Ford. Anybody can go buy a stock GT, but to make it perform, that's where it takes a little bit different brain power or twist internally, whether it be, you know, a simple piston modification or valving modification or the actual overall spec to make it work correctly for what we're trying to make, you know, the race cars do. That's uh, pretty much the last thing that the tire feels is what the shock's telling it to do. So that's what we've, you know, spent the last damn near 15 years uh, in the drag world making happen. And that's why, you know, I'd say we're, we're top dogs in the, in the drag suspension world. You all must be, when I looked at the list of teams and drivers that you all are associated with, it is one, a long list, as you mentioned, all around the world, from here in the States, Great Britain, uh, Europe, Australia, the Middle East, but there are some great names on that list. Give us a rundown real quickly, not everybody, but maybe some highlights on that list of who's running ERS products. I can make, the, make a few lists pretty easy. Uh... We, we currently supply the entire NHRA Pro Stock world with suspension on all four corners. Um, when you get into the PDRA and Eighth Mile Outlaw world, I'd say we have probably 90% of every team out there. Um, from the guys that, you know, struggle to qualify that are always trying to get better to the guys that are breaking world records every run out. Um, we've, been, we've been fortunate to have some of the strongest teams choose to run our product and at the end of the day we help them shine and they help us shine so without those guys supporting us we wouldn't be anywhere close to where we are today um, but we have a lot of brain power uh, within the company it's it's just myself my brother andy lambert my brother tim lambert that you know combined we have about i mean damn near 50 years of suspension experience from indycar sprint car nascar pretty much every form of racing uh, even with Formula One, uh, my brother Andy did that for some time, and it's just taking all the things that we've learned that you can't necessarily buy off the shelf from a different brand or a different competitor that that's really what puts us on top. And then working with the best teams in the world, doesn't matter if it's on a sand drag truck in Abu Dhabi or uh, the fastest, you know, outlaw eighth mile car in the United States, we have the same technology we try to share and spread out to everybody and it's it's really been uh it's really been great for us and the teams feel the same well you mentioned almost 50 years of history where does it all begin how did y'all get into the motorsports world and why shocks how did you gravitate towards suspension uh, that's a pretty good question actually we all went to the to vote tech for automotive technology um right out of high school you start there like the end of your 10th grade year and into 11th grade and uh at the time, Penske Racing Shocks and Penske Racing, they would take the top graduate from whatever graduating class you were a part of. And if you were 
on top of the list there, you got your shot to go to Penske. So my brother, Tim, uh, was the first guy. He went over to the IndyCar team uh, where he helped, you know, do engine assembly and pit crew. He was a fuel guy, the dead man on the fuel team, on the pit crew team, I should say, not fuel related. Uh, and then my brother, Andy, went to Penske Shocks and was doing the, net, or the IndyCar operation. Uh, my brother Aaron followed suit after that. And he he started doing a little bit of the NASCAR stuff and then kind of fell into the IndyCar deal. Uh, and this, when I first started at Penske, I was boxing shocks, believe it or not, and that just was not for me. It was uh, kind of redundant, not really what I wanted to do. I couldn't really spread my wings. Um, so long story short, I actually was gave my two weeks notice, and uh, that got me the, the spot to go to some sprint car, dirt modified. Um, some of those local races on a Thursday, Friday night, and then uh, an opportunity opened up in the NASCAR department. And the only way I could get that position is if I got my CDL. So I was uh, chomping at the bit to drive truck, mainly because once the truck got there and we got it all set up, I could learn how to build the shocks on the NASCAR and nationwide and truck series. So a few years after that, I was actually the youngest market manager that Penske had in charge of their NASCAR department. Um, and it just kind of snowballed from there. I mean, it's it's always been in our blood, the racing side of things, and we kind of, you know, took a liking to the suspension world because it's really no no rules. Um, it's not like the shock bodies are see through, and you can see what's going on. So you can really anything you can think of, if you can make it work, uh, it's usually an advantage, and that's kind of what we we strive on. We don't want to be the same shock that anybody can buy off, you know, off of any of the websites or you know, just a, a cookie cutter shock. We want to, we build all of our shocks tailored made to the customer's chassis, to their tire combination, transmission, automatic clutch, blah, blah, blah. There's so many different things that we want to ask customers when they order shocks. So when they open that up and bolt it on the car, uh, the first run down the track is a, an experience they haven't had yet, whether it's their career best run or their quickest 60 foot time or the smoothest handling car. That's what that's what puts a smile on our face is the phone calls after the race weekend, mainly for new customers. And I don't I don't care if it's a 13 second street car or, a, you know, a 550 quarter mile outlaw car. It's it's anything we can possibly do to make that customer happy. That's what we do, whether their budget's a thousand bucks or forty thousand bucks. We want to give you the best product for your hard earned money that we possibly can. And that's what we've done day in and day out. And I think that's why we, you know, are on the. Uh, on top of our game. And uh, as long as I'm able to do it, I plan on being on top. I don't, uh, I don't like being second place to anybody. Um, and nor do my brothers. We've been, we've had that instilled in us as long as possible that, you know, you always want to try your hardest. And I think when you try your hardest and put your heart behind it, no one can beat you. So that's, that's what we do. And it's, it's nice having, working with family. I know a lot of people are against that. And yeah, don't get me wrong. We, might yell and kick and scream at each other a little bit, but at the end of the day, there's 100% trust between all of us, and we do anything we can to make it the best for for all of us involved. So it's uh, it's been a little bit of a roller coaster, um, but looking back at it all, I wouldn't change any bit of it to be where we're at right now. Man, that's got to be a whole nother story for a whole nother time on the journey itself and all that y'all have been through and in. I mean, man, to be associated with Penske at the highest level over there in the IndyCar program, the NASCAR program, programs that have won championships in Indy 500s and Daytona 500s. Tell me, what does it feel like taking the uh, Penske brand and working with it and putting it into drag racing? Because other than a small foray in his younger days, Penske didn't have much to do with drag racing. So really, when you think about the shots, that's really kind of it. Yeah, I mean, that, uh, that all started the middle of 2006 for me. I was, I thought the only thing racing was, you know, turning left for four hours, which I don't take anything away from those guys. I have a lot of good friends and great friends and I'll probably have the rest of my life in NASCAR. Uh, but we got a phone call from Roger Penske himself to go do some testing with Alan Johnson and Mark Ingersoll uh, for some drag stuff. And I was always told when I was at Penske, kind of a peon that uh, the Penske shock didn't work on a drag car. We just couldn't get it to work. And my opinion, it was just, they had the wrong guy running that market. I mean, it used to be a, you know, 30, 40, $50,000 a year market. And it just, 
they didn't want to put any else any other money behind it because it was it was a loser to be honest with you uh so we went to our first test in valdosta which that was the first time i ever went to an actual test with a professional team and uh my brother tim and i were in talladega my brother aaron was there there because we have the they used to have the nascar super speedway shock rule uh, everybody had to run a spec shock so you couldn't jack the car down and mess with aerodynamics so anyway long story short my brother tim and i go from talladega to valdosta and uh, we had four sets of shocks and you know i i built a set my brother aaron built a set we had just an oddball set that we were like hell let's just see if something different works and uh, we had a set that matched their current shock package which um I mean, I'll say it, it was Coney. That's who, who, what everybody ran. I mean, everybody and their sister ran a Coney shock back in 06, 07. Um, so they got the car as dialed as they felt they could get. And we put on the shock that mimicked the Coney and it was a hundredth and a half faster to 330. And I was just like, I didn't really care to be honest with you. I was busy doing inventory on the trailer. And uh, by the end of that test, we were about 400 quicker overall ET, which looking back at that now, it's it, it's unheard of anymore. I mean, the, the big gain in NHRA Pro Stock, if you can pick up a hundredth, that's unbelievable. And we were three to four better every run. So at the end of that test, I got a phone call because I was supposed to be going to Bristol, which was the biggest suspension race of the year because it was it used to be a rough shit hole of a track, to be honest with you. So we did a lot of sales and a lot of work with the different teams. And uh, my boss called and he's like, hey, you're going to go with Mark Ingersoll to his house and then you're going to go to the St. Louis National next weekend. And I was, I was like, absolutely not. This is ridiculous. They got the shocks they need. I'm going to Bristol. Well, then I got a call from the big boss and he's like, hey, we'll take care of Bristol. You're going to go to St. Louis. Well, the rest is history. I'd ever revisited a NASCAR track after that. And I went to every national, dressed up as a Mopar employee. Everybody that was there that are now customers thought of me as the new guy that AJ hired to measure his rear tires. Well, really, behind the scenes, we were testing and making gains and looking at data with Mark Ingersoll, who I, you know, I deal with four or five times a week. He's now with Elite, and uh, I mean, he taught me so much that I can never repay him for. And that uh, it was all through that 07, 08 season where nobody really knew what Penske Shocks was just yet because we were exclusive with AJ and really weren't pushing the envelope. Um, but then after, you know, you start getting, I think there was, we had nine number one qualifiers after that, which was unbelievable. We couldn't quite put it together on Sunday, but you have to learn how to race on Sunday. And once that happened, I mean, it was, I think from 2009 to current, we, we have won every pro stock championship in the United States and own every record and every record book from pro stock so i got my start there and then after learning what pro mod was all about i mean it was we just took the ball and ran with that and it's i mean i love all forms of drag cars we have customers that you know they're happy going 160 60 foot we have customers that demand to go 90 60 foot and that's that's what keeps us on our toes is the variety of people we deal with uh we don't specialize in any one market I mean, we're absolutely dominant the big tire market. There's no one even close. Uh, but we have won some some of the biggest radio races in the world. We've won sand drag races. We've won uh, the Liwa Hill Climb over in Abu Dhabi. You know, as fast as you can get to the top of the biggest sand mound in the world. Uh, we've won that race in dominating fashion. We have just great customers all the way around the world. And it's uh, when we put our heads together here at PRS, there's really no one that can stop us. Um, so it's... It's been a whirlwind for sure from NASCAR to drag racing, but I look back at it, it was kind of a godsend because I'd probably be down in Charlotte right now, hating my life working on cup cars when here I am, I own my own business and I work with my family and it's great. It's absolutely perfect the way it all turned out. Adam, man, an awesome story uh, to hear that. I'm sure Penske is uh, appreciative that, hey, the brand is furthered that much more and it's winning that much more. I mean, anything he, he puts his name on, they seem to win, whether it's from NASCAR to V8 supercars. So you being a part of that, that is spectacular to hear and get the inside scoop on. So let me ask, uh, with everything you've said, I have to assume 
that you have met the captain himself. What is Roger Penske like? Uh, honestly, he's, he's the type of guy that you meet him once, he'll always remember your name, which is, unfortunately, I can't say the same. I'm terrible with names. <laughs> I'll always remember you because your glasses, but, you know, let's say a year from now, I'll be like, shit, what was your name? Oh, that's right, Lee. But, yeah, no, uh, RP, when – the, few, the, the first time I met him, I was actually 14 up at Nazareth. My brother Tim was on the IndyCar. He just started on that team. And I didn't really meet him, meet him. But fast forward, to, I think it was 2006. Uh, I'll save all the details because I don't throw anybody under the bus. But uh, we were called into battle from RP personally to do a little bit of work on their cup cars. And uh, that was when Ryan and Kurt ended up winning that race one, two. And ever since then, it been uh, it was you know kind of a pretty cool feeling to be the guys that helped them get to that plateau for Roger. Everything he's accomplished, everything he's done throughout the world of racing, um, to be able to actually put together the parts and pieces to help their teams win and runner up in the biggest race of the year for Cup was it was pretty awesome. Uh, but as far as knowing Roger, as long as you got a you know, a hot dog roller in the trailer, he's usually pretty happy. I mean, I can't I can't say anything at all negative about him ever. He's done so much for me and my family, uh, brothers especially, working with him and for him and behind his name. It's been it's been awesome. I mean, it's kind of been a, a dream come true. And a lot of people, I mean, just, you know, hear that name or, oh, yeah, we know about Penske, but to actually work directly with him for the last 20 years, I mean, it's been it's been absolutely awesome that's a that's a good thing to hear man that he is that quality type of individual the captain is i've got to ask i'm curious what makes a shock for drag racing different than something in open wheel or on a stock car what what would be the number one distinguishing factor uh it's kind of a loaded question i mean the way you look at like a big tire, especially, is you're trying to babysit the sidewall because it's so soft. Now, when you get into open wheel and cup and all the other, you know, forms of racing that turn left, right, do all these crazy things, uh, their sidewall spring rate is so high that the shock, you really can't. I mean, you can overwork the tire, and, but you're working on slip angles laterally, whereas, uh, whereas a big tire, you're trying to accelerate it in a straight line. So you're trying to not deflect the sidewall. You know, you're trying to give as little deflection to the sidewall as possible. And you got some guys that, you know, might be a little old school. They run crazy setups, and you see the tire just completely pissed off. Well, we try to pride ourselves. Anytime you can, let's say the tire is 105 inches of rollout, you know, staging, you want it to be 105, 30 feet into the run growing. You don't want it to be deflected to 100 inches because then you got, you know, you're trying to re-spin the tire when you've already, you know, changed it dynamically and that's that's the big part that we have learned a lot about working with the great teams that we work with that uh i mean that's the the main thing whereas a radial car i mean you're dealing with a sidewall it's as stiff as a board and you're just trying to give it as much power as the track's going to let you take um but on a big tire there's there's so many different things that that we try to control um it's i mean the, from spring rate, pinion angle, four link settings, weight percentage, all of that is directly connected to the way your shocks are set up. So for some people out there that sell shocks, like, oh, this is the shock you need. You need to bolt it on and don't touch it. That's, that's caveman way of thinking. I mean, from the way the driver releases the clutch, that completely changes your shock package. From the way that, you know, how, how aggressive your stator is in the converter, that changes the way your shock works. Um, just everything from carbon wheelie bar to a tie wheelie bar to a chrome alley wheelie bar, every little bit changes, you know, from an RJ build car to a Bitco build car to a Haas built car to a McCamus to an Andy McCoy, all those different things. Uh, although everybody's like, oh, well, it's a 68 Pro Mod. Well, from every little bit of that chassis changes the way that shock works. So we have somewhat of a baseline that we use on different chassis, different tires, uh, different transmissions, um, and that's, you know, then we just fine-tune it from there based on, you know, crew chief and everything else. You've mentioned in this 
Zoom stream that you've been to the track, you go to the tracks, you're working with the teams, and you still do that today, from what I can understand, with the website, or you're at least sending somebody out representing PRS. So what does it look like being a technician at the track and working with the teams? And, you know, what are you looking from the driver as feedback to help you with the shocks to, you know, improve a program and get them down the track? Uh, we have we have some drivers that are really technical as far as what the car's doing and how it feels. Uh, we have some drivers that they don't care how it feels. They just care about the ET. Um, so it's – I'm not saying it, it's wrong either way. You have some drivers that, you know, they're, oh, yeah, it was smooth down track. Everything was great. But then you look at the time slip and you know it's not on edge because it could be way quicker. Uh, but you have some people that are – they'll drive it. As long as it, the, the wheels are on the racetrack, they don't care how it feels. They just want to be as quick as humanly possible. But uh, really, day to day at the track, we get questions as easy as we need, you know, 30 pounds of rebound out of the back of the car. So we'll, my brothers or myself will lay under the car, click the adjusters, and customer's happy, and off we go. We have some customers that are number one in qualifying, and they want to pick up, you know, another hundredth or two. We're going to put power in the car. We're going to change the ratios. Uh, we're going to change the pinion angle. Let's change the shock to, you know, to complement that adjustment. And we'll, we'll be as in-depth with the crew chiefs as the crew chiefs themselves. Um, so it's, we get a whole different array of things to do, things to adjust. And that's really what I think has brought us to the point of where we're at is working with the best crew chiefs in the world, uh, you know, step by step. We've, we've had such an accelerated learning curve that, I mean, we've seen runs that, some crew chiefs, will, they won't see that many runs in a lifetime because after every round of qualifying, we'll see 16 to 20 runs where that certain crew chief might only see one or two. Now you times that by three or four different classes, we'll see 60 runs every time a session's over or most crew chiefs will see one or two or three. Um, so that's something that we can notice trends and see certain things of a car that most people will never see. So that helps us give a better product uh, to the end user. So the guys that might not have a data system or might not have a high dollar crew chief or the best of everything, we can give them a shock package that we know is not bulletproof because there's no magic in suspension. It's, there's a lot of hard work and hours put into it, but we can give them something that's light years ahead of the rest of their package. And, you know, they have more fun because they go up and down the track more often. And I think in the world of racing, if you can not shake the tires or not spin the tires, you're okay spending that extra money because you have so much money invested. You get about, let's say, three and a half seconds to eight seconds of fun. So if you spin the tires and then just coast the rest of the way, well, shit, that really wasn't worth it. But if you can go up and down, up and down the track more often, it might be worth that extra 1000 or 1500 2000 bucks for that shock package because now you get to enjoy the rest of the money that you put into that car. Well, through this conversation, you've mentioned IndyCar, NASCAR, drag racing, obviously. And on the website, you've got listed that you've got shocks in drag racing, street, off-road, snowmobile, circle track, motorcycle. The one I'm most interested in, though, is y'all have listed exotic. What is the most exotic vehicle that PRS shocks have been put on in, in, in operation? Uh, we, have, we have a few customers out there that do... Uh... So I'd say, let's say half a million dollar full blown, kind of like the Riddler uh, car that is a truly one off piece um, that, you know, they utilize our pneumatic lift system. Uh, they send the shocks out and have them completely polished like a mirror or paint match to their car. And uh, I mean, we've got customers with Lamborghinis and Skyline GTRs. And I mean, I've ripped off, uh, let's say, a $25,000 suspension on a a land cruiser or Range Rover that's fully hydraulically controlled that is actually pretty sophisticated suspension. And I have customers that are like, yeah, pull it off, put your stuff on. So we've got, I mean, as far as most exotic, it, uh, it's kind of hard to put a number on that, but uh, we have guys that um, take their brand new $100,000 $100, plus car that's perfectly fine and rides like a Cadillac, but they support us and they want our product maybe it's a trust that we, we built with them over the years that i mean we it's 
crazy. And we have guys with snowmobiles as well that, you know, they'll spend, you know, five to 8,000 bucks on suspension when the snowmobile itself was 10,000. So it's, but when it comes down to it, it's no different than the drag racer that wants to go out there and have fun with their machine that they put all their hard earned money into. It doesn't matter if it's got two wheels, four wheels. Um, they want the best performing piece they have, they can possibly get. And that's what we've, uh, we specialize in. I mean, if we don't care what it is, we'll do the best possible job we can to make sure you enjoy it. And it's, it feels and performs the way you want. But as far as exotics go, I mean, it's kind of tough to say from, you know, Lamborghinis all the way down to, you know, you just broke the world record last season with uh, the GTR customer over in the Middle East. And that those cars aren't cheap. You don't see them around the block all the time, but uh, the, the suspension they had on, they could get about two or three runs out of them. And they were constantly breaking the shafts and bending them. Uh, so we got hooked up with them through Khaled Abelushi. One of his friends had the car. So we put our stuff on and second run out, they broke the world record by a 10th, not a hundredth, a 10th, which was, they thought unheard of. And they've since eclipsed that too. And it's, uh, I mean, I, I look at every race car as exotic, you know, whether it's a brand new NHRA pro mod, uh, car that costs $400,000. I'm proud as hell to have our suspension on it all the way down to a, you know, a coyote stock car that people can build for 10 grand. I'm proud to have our stuff on those cars too. It's, we don't discriminate on uh, the price tag of the car as long as you have our shocks on, we're happy with it. Um, my brother's working on some new ATV stuff right now for some GNCC customers that, I mean, shocks are key because that's what's keeping the wheel to the track and, you know, not breaking your wrist every time you hit a bunch of whoops. Um, so it's, we try to specialize in everything. I mean, you can't put all your eggs into one basket and that's the one thing that we've learned. I mean, through these tough times everybody's going through, we. Uh, we know when we get back to racing, we want to make sure our customers are ready to rip, and uh, we don't care what it is, what kind of car it is. Obviously, we special. I myself specializes more in the drag racing side of things, but uh, whatever shocks are needed on anything, we're we're open open minded to it. Well, the relationship between power put to the ground has to be a harmonious relationship for anyone to ever succeed in motorsports and obviously shocks are a huge part of that and i'm sure for you all to provide a harmonious relationship you all spend a lot of time in the shop doing r and d research and development so i've got to ask how much time do y'all put to that in the working uh, working atmosphere and what is a shock dump what does that do a shock dump well that's uh that's I'll get back to the R&D side of it in a minute. Uh, the shock dump, you can hear that from a lot of different ways. I mean, it's the way I look at it, shock dump would be your car leaves the starting line with one setting and then it pneumatically controls, uh, you know, based off the clutch switch or the trans brake switch, it starts a timer and then releases the pneumatics and softens the shock down track, whether it be for bumps or aerodynamic gain or something like that. Uh, we have spring pneumatics as well so the car leaves the starting line with the spring at a certain ride height and then when those pneumatics are dumped it actually lowers the back of the car and that's a strict strictly for aerodynamics um, and that there also helps you get over bumps because it changes your four link and pinion angle and everything down track so you can leave the leave the starting line with one setting in the car and without stopping at the 330 and completely changing the entire race car you just bleed the air off the system and it, it does it already so as long as you do your homework in the pits uh when you get on the track it, you know a lot of these cars are i don't want to say automated but there's a serious pneumatic system going through that car talking to a lot of electronics that you know help shift points help the car you know strut change shock change compression and rebound whatever it might be uh but that's that's really the evolution of racing, right? So, I mean, you look back in, in the eighties, what did everybody had? They probably had a MSD six AL. That was like the hottest shit back then because, you know, you had a rev limiter and you had a pill that you could put in on the steering column. Well, a lot of times have changed. Now you got, uh, you know, between fuel tech and how tech and MSD and Holly and all these different companies. There's so many things that if you can think of it, it probably already exists in the racing world. But that's what also keeps us going because we want to be the we want to be on the leading edge of that. We want to be the ones that thought about it and made it happen. And uh, 
you know, that's where our, our pneumatic spring perches came up with. Uh, we ran them, let's see, that was um, in the 14th season, and they were undefeated pretty much, you know, won the championships in 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, and 2019 as well. And then all of a sudden, uh, certain series, I won't bash any of them, but, uh, you know, they got outlawed because that was going to save the racer. A $2,500 car was going to save racing. Well, turns out all it did was make us figure out other ways to make the cars perform. And that's really what it is. The rule books are what drives innovation. So the thicker the rule book, the more you need to think. And coming from NASCAR and IndyCar and everything else, their rule books are thicker than a phone book. So uh, there's a lot of different things and a lot of different ways to get around the rules. Not blatantly cheating, but bending. And that's, uh, I mean, I'll be the first to say it. That's what is so great about drag racing. NASCAR, you have, let's say you have two pistons or four pistons you can work with inside of a shock. Well, that's no fun. You know what I mean? That's not letting anybody gain, or gain uh, mental capacity by dealing with the same little piece every day, every night. Uh, so drag racing, it's as long as you have this shock, anything goes internally. And that's, I mean, that's what, you know, I've learned so much from the drag racing world because, you know, other forms you got, let's say 450 horsepower and four shocks. Well, you can only do so much because the tires aren't changing. But uh, then when you get down to it in the drag world, it's, it's wide open. And in, anything goes, really. And that's, that's what's driven me to where we're at now. And then same with what my brother Andy does for the power sports side of things. I mean, it's pretty much no rules. I mean, they might have a, an engine rule or a tire rule. But other than that, you can really uh, gain some advantages just by thinking outside of the box suspension-wise and setup-wise. That's, that's really where we strive to be. I've got no issues with the gray areas in a rule book. I'm, I'm a Harry Hyde fan, Smokey Eunuch, Chad Canal. They've all pushed the envelope, and I definitely yep. think in motorsports it's got to be pushed for it to ever move forward. So y'all keep pushing. Keep on doing it. Keep yep. on doing it. Now, with, with everything that's going on, the world right now is crazed with the coronavirus matter, and rightfully so. Lives are at stake. What does business look like for you all under these circumstances? How's it changed? Have you been able to get backlog caught up? Any special deals going on for your customers? What's business like? Uh, business, I mean, it's it's slowed down just like any anything really, but we're still we're still shipping boxes and we're still getting, you know, service work in from customers and placing new orders and I mean we're we're moving right along. And that's uh we're that actually has freed up a lot of time to do some R&D stuff that we've been wanting to do uh, that we just didn't have time because the season started off like gangbusters. I mean, it was the really since I'd say probably November into December, we have been busier those four or five months than we've ever been as a company. And it's, it's, it was great. And it's uh, now it's, it's definitely tailed off, but uh, it's, it could be a whole lot worse. I know there's other companies out there that have been laying off and uh, not necessarily working. And we have, we're, we're fortunate enough to say that, that that's not the case here with us. I mean, we're still chugging along. Could we be busier? Absolutely. But even when you're busy, you could be busier the way I look at it. I don't, I don't, but uh, yeah, we're, we're doing just fine. We got a lot of new things in the works. Um, so before we hit the track again, whether that's in, June, July, August, September, October, no one really knows. Um, we're going to make sure that our teams have something totally different than what they raced Orlando or prior with uh, because we don't want to get stagnant. We want to know, you know, when we were down there racing and even prior to that, Phoenix and Pomona with our pro stock customers, you know, they were hauling ass, winning a lot of races, and we want to know when we get to back to racing, we're not going back out there saying, oh, well, we were fast in February. Well, it's not February anymore. We can't we can't just kind of sit here idle and uh, you know go out and trim the bushes. We need to keep working because that's what racers do. And I'm confident in all the customers. They're not they're not sitting at home not doing anything. They're finding ways to improve and get better. And whenever it is we go back to racing, hopefully sooner than later, I'm sure the guys that that busted their butt in this downtime, uh, this unfortunate downtime, we're dealing with. Uh, 
they're going to come out with guns a-blazing. There's no way they're going to slow down because they didn't go to the shop or didn't work on the race cars. <laughs> it's, uh, I, I, it's, it definitely sucks, the whole corona thing. I mean, it's, it's terrible. I feel for everybody out there affected by it. I mean, everybody as a whole has been affected by it. I don't care if you're in the racing world, if you're in the, if you're in the whatever world, unless you're in the toilet paper world, everybody's been, been hit by it somewhat, somehow, some way. Uh, but that's the one thing about the racing community that you don't see a lot with a lot of other communities, really. We all we all got each other's back through all of this shit. And that's why I'm, I'm confident when it comes back, it might be a little slow at first, but uh, it, we're going to get back to business as usual. And there's going to be, you know, everybody's going to want to, they're chomping at the bit right now. Like if they would say, hey, Let's see, what's today? Friday, a week from today, everybody go to Galat, and we're going to have a race. <laughs> that place is going to be packed. One way or another, it's going to be packed. So uh, I think when we get back to racing, it's, uh, yeah, it's, it sucks right now, but we're going to get back to it, and it's going to be better than better than ever. It's just a matter of when it happens. So Precision Racing Shocks, you're roughly, I'll say, located in central Pennsylvania. I've got to ask. Eastern, Eastern Pennsylvania. Eastern Pennsylvania. Yes, so sir. I've got to ask, most of the racing world seems to be in geographical relation to Indianapolis or Charlotte, North Carolina, Mooresville, some of it Southern California. How do you think Pennsylvania works out for you all as a business and relating to racing? A lot of racing there, but how has it worked out over the years? Uh, honestly, the way I look at it, uh... I used to think of that exact thing back in the day when I was actually an employee at Penske Shocks and uh, Rogers IndyCar Shop was less than a quarter mile from our suspension headquarters. Uh, I, I, there's definitely something to be said about being at the, you know, Indy or Charlotte or wherever. Um, but for what we do, as long as FedEx and UPS run, it doesn't really necessarily, if, if anything, I think it makes us stronger because we don't get, sidelined or distracted by other shit that's going on if I can say shit um, but Penske being right down the road in my opinion I mean they're one of the smaller shock companies as far as total employees but hands down they are the best of the best of what anybody can offer in the suspension world and that's I mean to have them 15 minutes down the road and to have such a tight relationship with them it's you know if we get a hair in our ass and we're like, hey, we need this, this, and this. We can drive right down the road, get it, get it back, do what we need to do to it, and out the door it goes. If we got a call halfway across the country, ship this, ship that, well, before you know it, maybe the parts come and you didn't think of something, and now you're two or three days back. More orders are coming in, and it just snowball effects. So for me, I, I don't think there's any place uh, geographically located that would be better for my company uh, to be than and really right here i mean it's it's uh it just works you know what i mean like it's i i don't i don't really like to mess up something that's working you know what i mean um at one point i was in uh oklahoma when we first started the company and it was there was nothing wrong with it but by the time you look at your bottom number and you're spending five six seven hundred dollars a week in shipping because you know how racing works hey i needed it yesterday well, uh, that's a lot of overnight shipping going on. And I can, you know, 15 minute drive, I can have what I need to have and get the customer their products quicker. And at the end of the day, that's what makes the customer happy. If they call today and say, hey, I need something by Monday, we could probably make it happen. And that's, uh, yeah, I, I just think being here is, uh, is pretty good for us. Now, if I was an engine shop, it probably wouldn't be good because down in the Charlotte area, you can take blocks and this and that to be, you know, honed, machine, welded, fixed, all this other stuff. We don't have that. We have a little in-house machine shop, and then Penske's got a large machine shop. And for what I do, this is a, a good spot. But if I was in other ends of racing, I probably wouldn't need to be here. I need to be somewhere else. Definitely interesting to hear that with what you're doing in the world of motorsports, that uh, it works out fine for you not being in the hubs and possibly even even better the hubs are cool but there's just something fascinating about guys that are getting things done in motorsports and they're not associated with where everybody else has decided to collect it together 
in the racing world. So definitely, definitely keep up the good work. Now, Adam, mostly so far I've talked to drivers and a few team owners. You're the first individual I've got to talk to that is producing a part in getting it out there in the motorsports world. I've been asking drivers on their last word take to your fans, to your uh, partners, and to your competitors. Give me the last word. For you, though, for the last word in this interview, talk to your customers and your fellow shock competitors out there in racing. Uh, to the fellow shock competitors, it's going to be a totally different response than to my customers and friends and uh, race teams that I deal with. To the competitors out there, just try your best to keep up. Um, Keep up the good work. It's I don't like to talk bad about anybody, to be honest with you. There's a lot of guys out there that do the same thing I do or attempt to do the same thing we do. Um, it's I don't mind competition. A uh, little bit of a backstory: When I was at Penske and Don Ness was the guy, the late, great Don Ness was the guy to get suspension from. You know, I talked to Don two or three times a weekend at the racetrack, and that was the point where I had one race car. He had everybody else. I didn't hate the guy. He was just, he had, was in racing since before I was born, so I can't knock him for it. No different than the other guys out there that build shocks and put them on cars. Um, I don't knock them for that because they're doing what I'm doing. It's just my job to do it better, and that's why I'm here. I mean, it's, I like competition. Competition is no different than rule books. It's what drives you to be better and think of different ways to skin a cat or a different mousetrap or whatever, whatever you want to use in that saying, I don't, I don't really talk bad about any. There's some guys that I don't send Christmas cards to, um, and nor would I ever, but there's also some guys that are direct competition that I talk to, let's say once or twice a month, you know, whether I used to work with them or I see them at the track. I don't, I don't knock them for it. I mean, get out there and make money. I hope, I hope everybody can make money. Um, but to our customers and the guys that are out there tromping at the pit to get back to racing, uh, just got to say thanks. I mean, without them, we wouldn't be here. Um, without them giving us their race cars to test R&D or put our products on, we wouldn't shine the way we do. And I hope we give them back the same the same shine that they give us. Uh, you know, whether it, like, like I said before, whether it's our street customers that, you know, buy a an affordable package or it's our top pro teams. Every one of you are important to us equally. And when all the, all this shit settles and we get back to racing, you know, hopefully we see everybody at the track and all the different series, whether it's NHRA or PDRA or NMCA or any of the ones that we're involved with. Uh, but yeah, I just want to say thanks because without you guys, we wouldn't be here. I'd probably be, I don't know, working somewhere else, but I love what I do and we couldn't do it without you guys. So, Thank you for that. Drag racing fan, IndyCar fan, NASCAR fan, motorsports enthusiast. I hope you've enjoyed this interview. I definitely have for Adam Lambert of Precision Racing Shocks. I'm the Monday Morning Racer, Lee Craft. All of this on Drag Racing TV brought to you by strutmasters.com. Folks, until next time, stay safe, God bless, and keep the pedal to the metal. Oh, <laughs>